right, good morning and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Rika. I am the Director of Client Relations here and I am super excited to be here with all of you today. We have such an incredible webinar coming up with Dr. Samuel Wood, who is truly just a pioneer within the fertility realm. And we're so lucky to have him here today. Um, we're gonna be talking about ovarian rejuvenation and the benefits of that and all of the things that Gen 5 offers for families that are looking for fertility services. So without further ado, I hope that everybody has their coffee with them this morning and um, you know we're ready to get started. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about Dr. Wood. He is such a unique fertility specialist. He has been voted top doctor in the US, America's top doctor, superb, superb, super doctor. Uh, he's one of the only fertility specialists in the world that have been honored in who's who in the world, who's who in America, who's who in science and technology um, with a Lifetime Achievements Award, uh, Distinguished Humanitarian, 50 People to Watch. He's also certified as a high complexity laboratory director in reproductive genetics, which is, you know, PGS, PG, uh, PGD, which is something that a lot of you will become familiar with, if not already. Uh, he's been featured in New York Times, BBC, Newsweek, and over a hundred television and radio programs. He's a specialist in clients with low prognosis, offering many unique protocols. And that's truly one of the benefits of going with Gen 5, that everybody comes from a unique path. And Dr. Wood and our team here are able to meet everyone's needs and offer all things under one roof when it comes to fertility. He uses many special techniques, including uh, PRP and Plaque Ultra, you know, to enhance fertility, which today we're going to be getting to dive into all of that. Uh, he's, you know, active researcher and he's, you, you know, working as the medical director and president and one of the leading fertility centers in the world, which is Gen 5 Fertility. And again, without further ado, I'm so excited to jump this over to Dr. Wood and have him be our speaker this morning. Remember, to tune in till the end because we do have some incredible prizes for everybody that joined us today. We want to thank you all for being here, taking your Saturday to spend with us. And if you have any questions, please use the chat box to ask all of your questions. We'll answer them all at the end of the webinar. And whatever we don't get to, we have your names and hopefully your emails and contact information. So we'll have our lovely front desk staff reach out and set up follow-up appointments for you. So again, I am so excited to welcome Dr. Samuel Wood this morning, and I can't wait to jump into ovarian rejuvenation. We're going to be discussing ovarian rejuvenation, which I think is probably the most important topic in the field of infertility right now. There are so many women that are in a situation where they feel like they just can't succeed because of age or because of a low AMH or a high FSH, all of these problems that are so difficult. And when they go to see a fertility specialist, they don't hear good things. They, they're told, you need to use an egg donor. You don't have enough follicles. You don't have enough eggs. And that's very, very sad. And on a daily basis, I meet these women and I know they would be just astounding parents if we could just give them a chance. So today, I'm going to tell you about the latest in ovarian rejuvenation, including some things that we just began doing in the last two to three weeks. So let's start with this slide. I'm sure you've seen it many, many times before. It's a deadly slide. Look at what happens to fertility as a woman ages. This is at the age of 20 to 24. And you can see that it falls progressively after that. And so by the time a woman is 45, she has essentially zero chance of becoming pregnant. We have been able to help some women who are 45 and over, but it's not easy to do. Everything needs to be done right. And we'll discuss some of those things today. Also look at the miscarriage rate, even when you become pregnant, the miscarriage rate can be extremely high. In fact, it's over 90% when you're 45 and over. 
So it's not a matter of just helping someone get pregnant. You have to help them get pregnant in such a way that they don't miscarry after they become pregnant. Now, what causes this great fall in fertility with age? Well, what it really is, it's a fall in the number of eggs, in particular, the quality of those eggs. Let's take a look at this slide. When a woman is about halfway, when a woman's mother is about halfway through the pregnancy with her, that young fetus, that fetus has almost 10 million eggs. By the time she's born, she's down to 1 million. She loses many millions just getting to birth. And then by the time she goes through puberty, when she has her first period, she's down to around 100,000 eggs. And then every month, it doesn't matter if you're pregnant. It doesn't matter if you're taking birth control pills. No matter what you're doing, the number of eggs continues to fall and the quality of those eggs falls as well. Now, what, what do I mean by quality? What I mean is that the chance that they will create an embryo that is genetically normal, it progressively falls with age. So this is what we're facing. Now, what is a follicle? Well, a follicle really involves cells. And let's just look at this particular follicle here, cells around an egg. And as the follicle grows, it begins to accumulate fluid. And so when a woman goes in to see how her cycle's going or to see how many follicles she has before she begins her cycle, what we actually measure on the screen is the size of the fluid. And this is the fluid. Now, once this follicle gets to 18 millimeters or so, then it's ready to release the egg. And it varies woman to woman, but it's usually around 18 to 20 millimeters. And at that stage, it ruptures, the follicle ruptures, and it allows the egg to be released. It's then picked up by a fallopian tube, and it begins the path toward the sperm and the eventual path to the uterus where implantation can happen. Now, anti-Mullerian hormone is by far the biggest uh, fertility hormone available to assess fertility. Now, it's been misused, and I'll go into that a little bit. But almost everyone that I see when I talk to them on the phone, when I do a consult, they know their FSH and they know what kinds of levels that they want for an AMH. And so ovarian rejuvenation in part involves doing things designed to increase the AMH to get it at a level where there's a much better chance of success. Now, what it does, AMH, is it reflects the number of small follicles. It reflects the ovarian reserve. What does ovarian reserve mean? It means how many eggs are left within the ovary. So AMH is used as a reflection of the number of eggs that remain in the ovary. And as that number falls, then the chance of success drops. It's not true for all women under all circumstances, but that's generally the idea. This progressively falls with age. Now there's ups and downs, and so you will see some changes in AMH over time, but in general, it's a downward path. And it is a good predictor of IVF success, but only in some women. I think one of the most important studies that uh, has been published in the field of infertility was in 2017. And what that showed is that under some circumstances, AMH has very little relationship to fertility. And we have found that's true as well. We have helped now many, many women with very low AMH levels become pregnant and have babies using some of the techniques that I'll discuss in a few minutes. Unfortunately, many doctors don't seem to believe that study, even though it was published in the number one medical journal in the US. And so they look at a patient's AMH and they say, mm, we don't work with women who have an AMH under one. And that's very, very sad because there are many, many, many babies from women who have an AMH under one. So if you're seeing someone, make sure you understand their criteria because those criteria can actually be used to push you into egg donation, can be used to push you into something that you really don't want to do. So this is the most challenging area of infertility. One of the things that I've noticed and I've been doing IVF now for roughly 30 years, is that it's become easier and easier to help patients become pregnant. Many patients that we thought were difficult in the past, it's now very straightforward. And almost every woman, let's say between 35 and under, and really 37 and under, becomes pregnant without problem, assuming there are no other 
difficulties in addition to infertility. But when a woman is older, especially when she's over 40, 42, or when she has a high FSH level, it can be very, very difficult. And this is the area that I care the most about. And what are these women like? Well, they'll come in and they'll say, I have low ovarian reserve. I have a low antrophotical count, which means that they have very few follicles left in the ovaries when an ultrasound is done. That antrophotical count is used to predict the number of eggs that, is, that they're thought to make if they do an IVF cycle. And unfortunately, again, many fertility specialists look at that number, and if that number is under five, they won't even work with them. Even though those eggs may be normal, if you do everything right, they may make a normal egg, they may have a normal embryo, and they may be able to have a baby. They also say that they have few eggs, no eggs, poor quality eggs, or they've gone through, they have created eggs, they've created embryos, but when they're genetically tested, unfortunately, they were found to be abnormal. And finally, low or no implantation, or they implant, but they miscarry. So these are women who go through a cycle, they create an embryo, it's found to be genetically normal, but unfortunately either does not implant or it implants and it's followed by a miscarriage. So overall, we're talking about few or no eggs or a higher number of eggs, but very poor quality embryos generated from those eggs. The problem has been that nothing nothing anyone has tried, anyone has considered, has written about, has actually been shown to slow this age-related decline in fertility. And it's not for lack of trying. There's so many ideas out there. I've only included a few here. I'm sure many of you know some of the other ones that have been touted as potentially helping this problem. And so all kinds of different protocols. You, you go to one fertility specialist and another, and they say, well, we wanna do this protocol. We wanna do that protocol. This protocol is better for what you have. But the truth is no one has shown that any protocol increases the chance of women in this situation becoming pregnant. Now there certainly are protocols that worsen the chance of becoming pregnant. And uh, if, if we speak sometime in person, I'll tell you about those. Growth hormone has been around for a long time. Does it work? Who knows? There's some studies that say it works. There are others that say it does not work. If it works at all, it may work slightly in women over the age of 42, but it's highly questionable. Androgens like DHEA, so much news has been written about DHEA. I've met so many women that are on DHEA. And it may be that DHEA will cause you to create another egg or two eggs. However, what it doesn't do is help you become pregnant. What it doesn't do is help you have a baby. And of course, that's what it's really all about. There are many supplements out there and probably CoQ10 is, is, is the most popular one right now. And there was one study that indicated an improvement in egg quality, but it didn't reach statistical significance. So it's been very disappointing in that area as well. Bottom line is nothing's ever been shown to increase live birth rate. And we're not doing this to increase AMH, to increase the chance of a pregnancy. We're doing this to create live births, to help you have a live birth. Rejuvenate, it's a great word. It means to make young again, to restore to a former state, to make fresh or new again. And I think all of us love the concept of rejuvenation in our own lives, and the lives of others, and the lives of many things that we deal with on a daily basis. And that's what this is all about. Let's look at the ovary. Now, as you saw in that previous slide, the follicle begins as only a single layer of cells around an egg, and then it progressively grows and matures until the egg is released. And so in general, the problem is that there are fewer eggs. And so keep this slide in mind because we'll be talking more about this in a couple of minutes. Now, what are platelets? Rejuvenation, the way we do it, involves platelets. But platelets are not these brown cells. There's a lot of them, but it's not them. It's these small purple cells here. 
those are the platelets. And the platelets are just simply another component of blood. Plasma is the fluid component of blood. And then the red blood cells, their white blood cells, and then their platelets. Platelets are a really interesting cell. When I was in medical school, almost no attention was placed on platelets other than to discuss their role in stopping bleeding. And they do have an important role there. But as it turns out, by far the most important role that a platelet has is to repair injured areas. Once they're activated, they release growth factors. And when they release those growth factors, they stimulate stem cells. They cause the growth of new red blood, I'm, I'm sorry, the, uh, uh, of new blood vessels once they're activated. And that's why they're so important. Whenever there's an injury to the body, the platelets rush to that area and they begin this process, this process of releasing these critically important growth factors once they're activated. And in the case of an injury, what activates them is the injury itself. We have other ways of activating them, as you'll see in a moment. So take a look at this slide. You can see that the platelet is here and there, there are granules within the platelet that contain these growth factors. And once they're activated, you can see that numerous growth factors are released. This is just a minimal list of all the growth factors that are released. And they do, in addition to what I just discussed, they may also stimulate ovarian stem cells. We're not sure if this is true or not, but they may stimulate ovarian stem cells to become eggs. And I hope that's true, but nothing we do counts on that because in my mind, this is still an unknown subject. We don't know the answer to that question. How do you prepare PRP? PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma. What you do is you collect blood and then you place the blood in an incubator. And there are many different kits that are used that are specially designed to allow it to be easy to isolate the platelets. And then once you have the platelets, you inject that as well as the platelet-rich plasma portion of the sample, and that's what you inject into the ovary. So if we looked at this a little more closely. This is what blood looks like before it goes through the process in order to find and isolate the platelets. And you can see that this is the platelet portion. So what we do is we take this fluid and we pour it out, and then we go in and we remove the platelet portion into a syringe, and that's what we use in order to inject into the ovaries. So generation zero of ovarian rejuvenation was actually first done in 2016. That's when it was reported. And it used platelet-rich plasma. And let me go back to that slide. It used general anesthesia, it used laparoscopy, and direct injections into the ovaries. The problem is that you can't see through an ovary. And so what they were doing is lifting the ovary up and making multiple injections into the ovaries without really being able to see where they were. So it was a substantial procedure. It involved general anesthesia and they were blind injections into the ovary. There are still some centers that do this, or actually, from what I understand, a few in the US that will put you to sleep in order to do this. Whether or not it works is unclear, but it's definitely clear that this is a much riskier procedure than what occurred subsequent to generation one. Now, generation one also involves platelet-rich plasma, but instead of putting someone to sleep, and blindly injecting the ovaries, instead we use the ultrasound. Now, any of you that have ever had an ultrasound know that you can actually see the inside of the ovaries. You can see where the follicles are. You can see where the blood vessels are. You have an outstanding idea of what's going on in an ovary by using, um, by using ultrasound. And so that was first done by a Gen 5 fertility physician. And there are other centers now that have joined and are using uh, PRP to do generation one ovarian rejuvenation. Now, what we found with time is that generation one, it does work, but it works at a lower level than some of the newer techniques. So we rarely recommend this, but there are certain circumstances under which it's a good idea. Generation two is enriched platelet factors or MPLAF. 
It has become known as MPLAF over time. However, MPLAF is just simply one way of isolating those growth factors. You remember the side where you saw the platelets, which when activated released those various growth factors. So what we do with this procedure is instead of, of, um, of injecting the activated platelets, instead we take the activated platelets, we put them into an incubator and we give it time and the platelets release growth factors. We then go in and we isolate the growth factors that have been released and that's what we inject into the ovary. Now, we're currently doing a study to determine, to, uh, determine the exact values, but it appears that at least for some of the important growth factors, you get 10 to 15 times higher concentration of those growth factors when you do this technique, as opposed to doing the generation one uh, injection of activated platelets. No anesthesia is involved in this, very thin needles, minimal discomfort, except for rarely. And uh, it's a very, very nice procedure. And you get this big jump in the growth factors. However, it does not last as long as the results that you see when you put PRP in. So the advantage of generation one is it lasts longer. It lasts longer, but the height of the growth factor concentrations is lower. So what that did is it cost us to actually create generation three ovarian rejuvenation. And I will tell you that about that in just a moment. So as I told you, with PRP, you take the platelets, you activate them, and then you inject them into one and then the other ovaries. With MPLAF or enriched platelet factors, you take the platelets, you activate them, and then you put them into an incubator, which allows them to release these growth factors over time. And then you isolate the growth factors and you inject them into each ovary. So generation three is a combination of generations one and two. And we have had wonderful results with this. And probably about half of the procedures that we do now involve ultra. There's a patent pending on uh, this procedure as well. And I think for most patients who have traditional problems that require considering ovarian rejuvenation, this is the way to go. Now, we have a graphic here that shows you what I just said, and let's watch that. So it's a simple blood draw. It goes into a centrifuge isolate the platelets. They're then activated. And then we use the ultrasound and a needle that's placed into the ovary to release, to place the PRP. to give it one to two hours of incubation. And once again, we inject into the ovaries. You combine them in a special way to create ultra. It likewise is injected into the ovary. Now, it's, it's important to remember that it, it's not just injecting into the ovary. The question is, where do you inject? And I think that's a critically important factor here. And uh, several people have done PRP and had very poor success with it. And I think that one of the reasons is that they simply haven't injected it into the correct location within the ovaries to get an optimal response. All right, now, how do we select 
which ovarian rejuvenation generation to use. I think this may be the most common question that I get when I see a patient that's considering ovarian rejuvenation. They say, should I do one? Should I do two? Should I do three? And as you'll learn later, there's now even a generation four. And I think it's a really important topic and you have to look very carefully at the patient. You have to look at what their diagnosis is. Some women are in this situation because they had endometriosis and someone went in and they had good motives, but they went in and they said, I'm gonna get rid of all the endometriosis. And instead of just getting rid of the endometriosis, they actually killed many eggs in the process of doing that. You have to look at what the antropolical count is, AMH, FSH. You have to look at every detail, including menstrual cycle characteristics. Some women don't have periods at all, of course. Some are very regular, some are irregular. And you have to look at the BMI, basically the weight of the woman as well in order to choose the correct uh, treatment for them. We have special approaches for perimenopausal and menopausal women, and they involve pretreatment before we begin, as well as some other factors that we'll talk about in a few minutes. So who is ovarian rejuvenation for? I have patients call and they don't need ovarian rejuvenation and I tell them that. Sometimes the reason they haven't gotten pregnant is they haven't received high quality care. They just haven't. I look at the protocols that have been used and the chance of someone becoming pregnant using those protocols is very low. So you need to make sure that you're a true candidate for it it actually has a reasonable chance of success for you. And you have to make sure that it's not just a matter of how your treatment has been done up to that point. So POF or POI, these are both premature ovarian failure or premature ovarian insufficiency. It actually seems to work very well for these women. We have a good deal of success with these women in all cases, but it does appear to wake the egg up to some extent. And so we see more follicles and we see a higher success rate with POF and with POI following ovarian rejuvenation. Now, the thing about POF and POI, if you don't know, is that, that, is that a woman actually has completely normal numbers of eggs. This is not like menopause at all. This is not premature menopause. They have eggs, but those eggs are simply unable to respond. And so by doing ovarian rejuvenation, as well as medical treatments, you can reverse this or at least get the woman to the stage that she has an excellent chance of becoming pregnant and having a baby. Another group is women who actually make completely normal numbers of eggs. They're AFC, they're AMH, everything is normal. But when they create the eggs and then the embryos and they're tested, they're genetically abnormal. And so they don't become pregnant for that reason. This again is an outstanding use of ovarian rejuvenation. And we have a number of patients that have been in exactly that situation and been unable to succeed. In fact, if you look at the research uh, link section of our website, you'll see a publication, I think it was from November of 2020, that discusses this exact scenario and gives an example of it. A woman who, I, I, as I recall, had done seven cycles, made plenty of eggs, plenty of embryos, but not once had there been a normal one. But after she did implant, then she was able to create a normal egg and has subsequently, subsequently had a baby. The main group of women who ovarian rejuvenation is used for are women who have age-related decline in ovarian response. And this age-related decline can happen at various ages. Even though the average age of menopause is 51.5, there are women in their early 40s, many women in their early 40s that are either menopausal or close to menopausal, just based on differences in their physiology. So it's called ovarian resistance, insufficiency, poor ovarian response, reserve, advanced reproductive age. So there are a, a whole bunch of different names for this, but it all boils down to what we said earlier, just not enough eggs, not enough high quality eggs in order to get a normal embryo that can give them a healthy live birth. And then there's these last two areas, perimenopause and menopause. Now, in order to be diagnosed with menopause, it has to be one year since you've had your last period. But of course, that means very little. What really matters about menopause in perimenopause is, do you have any eggs left? 
are you able to create eggs? Are you still having periods? Even if, if it's only been three months or six months since you had your last period. These are the most difficult cases to deal with, most difficult. And it breaks my heart to see them. And so it's something that I'm extremely interested in. And we put a lot of effort into seeing if there's a way to help these women. They're desperate and they deserve a chance. So what can be done for them? As I mentioned earlier, the answer for a long time has been nothing. In fact, most fertility centers won't try. 80% of the fertility centers in the world have never had a live birth in any woman 42 and over. So it shows you that if you're 42 and over or you have characteristics associated with that and you go to a fertility center, an average fertility center, you're gonna have almost no chance of success. In fact, many of them will not even try. When you come in over a certain age and different fertility centers use different ages as their cutoff, they simply say, you need to use an egg donor. And so as I've been pondering this, I looked at some anti-aging research, which is another interest of mine, and have found some very interesting things that we're now using on a routine basis. NAD plus is a molecule that's present in every cell of the body and it does many important things. Unfortunately, it falls with age and there's research, especially in animals indicating that NAD plus is one of the more important hormones when it comes to aging. If you look at this graph, you can see the dramatic fall in NAD plus uh, between uh, the ages of 40 and 80. And so one approach has been, and this has been used in animals and is now being used in humans as well. One approach is to increase NAD plus levels. And so a very interesting study was done, and this was done in mice. And what they did was give the mice NMN. And now NMN is in the pathway, and it is something, it's a precursor to the creation of NAD+. And let's look at this graph at the bottom. This has to do with quality of eggs. So this shows the number of cells that were present in the embryo prior to being treated. And then you can see what happened after two, seven, 14, and 28 days. And you can see the dramatic increase in the quality of these embryos. And this is just one aspect of this study. But basically what happened is these mice that were perimenopausal were actually returned to a much earlier stage and they were able to have pups and they were able to return to near normal fertility just by taking NMN which as I mentioned is something that's in the pathway that leads to NAD+. So we now call this AOA or anti-ovarian aging. And what we're doing is we're actually taking the research that was done in mice and we're actually applying it to human women. And we've had some very interesting results. I think it'll probably be end of this year or early next year before we publish this data. But the question has always been, can we replicate what's been done in mice and humans? And is there anything else we can do along the way to increase the chance that anti-ovarian aging will work? Generation four is really our response to that. Now there are two aspects to this. I don't wanna make this complicated. If you're in this situation, we'll go through this with you in detail. But this is an entirely new concept in ovarian rejuvenation. What this involves is taking supplements, not only NMN, but other supplements at the right levels so that we can replicate what was seen in mice. This is an ongoing project and we've changed which one we use. We've changed the dosage that we recommend as time has passed and we've been able to evaluate the data as we've been able to look at the response with different supplements in different doses of those supplements. And we're actually in the process now of creating a supplement that has exactly the right concentrations to make this easier for women that are doing generation four ovarian rejuvenation. We combine this with fertility IV therapies. And I think that is very important. And we do these every week to every two weeks while they're also taking 
these supplements. By the way, I wanna make a point that the things that are mentioned on this slide are also things that are available to women who are doing generations one to three of ovarian rejuvenation. We've also created this new ovarian rejuvenation technique that involves doing ultra, which as you recall, is PRP plus MPLA, plus we also inject directly into the ovary, we inject anti-ovarian aging factors. I'm very excited about this. And we've had a number of women that have done this and we're looking forward to those results and publishing those results in the future. To my knowledge, this is the first time that this has been done anywhere in the world. And uh, as I mentioned, we're not done with this. We, we know we don't have things perfect yet. And so we're continuing to look at the data and make whatever changes are needed to give these women a chance. These women before had virtually no chance other than just blind luck. But we're hoping that by doing this and doing this well, they will have a real chance of success. Now, I wanna make a couple points here. Multi-ovarian rejuvenation, I think is important. Now, ovarian rejuvenation is not cheap. It's not cheap. And unfortunately, it does not work in all cases. So we recommend that you consider doing multi-ovarian rejuvenation depending on the reason that you're doing it. And so what I mean by that is that you choose a three cycle package, a three ovarian rejuvenation package. And why would you do that? Well, some women simply don't respond well to the first treatment. Some need a second. We've seen, we've seen cases where a woman has what appears to be almost no response the first time and has a dramatic response the second time. So it gives you an overall greater chance of success. In some cases, you'll see a response, but it's a moderate response. And so women will do it again to get a larger response. And we've had a case, for example, of a woman whose AMH was 0 0.03, who after three of these cycles using ovarian rejuvenation was able to get up to 1.33. So a really remarkable response by doing more than one. And I know how expensive it is to do fertility treatment. And one of the things that I like about this is that it's a lower cost per treatment if you choose to do the three cycle package. As I said earlier, some women don't need this. And we'll discuss that with you if it's something that you're considering. The other thing is this, multi-cycle packages. This is so important. You have to be very realistic with yourself. When you're about to start a cycle, you have to ask yourself, what's my chance here? And there's certainly many women that have 70, 80% chance in the first cycle. They don't need multiple cycle packages because those women are also going to create extra eggs and extra embryos. So they're gonna have enough to do more than one cycle without doing more than one egg retrieval. But they're women that that just simply is not true. And so if they pay for one cycle, there's a good chance that in one cycle, they're not gonna succeed. They need two cycles, three cycles. And so I asked the team here to put together a package that would help women like that. And so this is what we call real mini IVF. Now there's all kinds of mini IVF, but most of it is not real mini IVF. It's just something someone created and called it mini IVF. So what this refers to is following the Japanese type of mini IVF. And so here you're mainly taking oral tablets and then we have a few injections along the way. This is minimal compared to what's done in a standard IVF cycle. Now this is only right now, it's only for women with four or fewer follicles. And why is that? Because if you have more than that, this is the wrong approach. It's the wrong approach. And a study, a wonderful study done by a believer in mini IVF showed that pregnancy rates are higher if you do standard IVF. But that's not true for women who have only two or three follicles. When you use this protocol, this real mini IVF protocol, you're still gonna get two to three follicles. So there's no reason for you need to do the much more costly conventional IVF if you only have two to three follicles. 
one to three, let's say. And so the way this cycle, this, this protocol works, this package works, is that you do barren rejuvenation. And then four weeks later, you begin the first cycle of stimulation. And you do that for three months. And you use, as I said, very low doses of medication uh, during these cycles. We have already had success with this. And I'm thrilled about that. These are women that did ovarian rejuvenation and then did these packages. And I love it. I think it's fantastic. And it's something that we're going to continue to do for three months. During the first three-month trial, it's, it's under 20,000 to do these three cycles. And so I want it to be available to everyone. I want everyone under these circumstances, in these circumstances, to have a chance. So it involves doing three cycles, three egg retrievals, and one embryo transfer. And by doing that, you have a far higher chance of success than you have simply doing one cycle if you're in this category with a low AMH and with very few follicles. Let me give you some uh, recent examples of success. And these were picked out because I asked one of the coordinators, tell me three of your, of your recent um, uh, best cases. So the first one's 44 years old. She had been able to become pregnant with IVF in the past, but had had three consecutive miscarriages. Her AMH level was high, 17.5. AMH level was low, 0.21. She did MPLAF. She's now 32 weeks pregnant. A 43-year-old had previously failed four IVF cycles. AMH, 0.08, FSH 30, very, very difficult numbers. She did ultra. She made one egg, one normal embryo, and she has an ongoing pregnancy. Another woman, 43 years old, 11 years of infertility. She failed six previous IVF cycles. She had never made a normal embryo. She did MPLAF, she created one normal embryo, and now has an ongoing pregnancy. And that's what this is all about. All of these women had been told you need an egg donor, but they didn't need an egg donor. They just needed everything to be done right to give them the chance they deserved. We believe in add-ons, these extras. Now, we don't know exactly what effect they have, but we have seen women who had considered better cycles after they did some of these. Acupuncture, yoga, meditation, counseling, diet. We have other treatments coming that will be in-house. We want the entire, all of you to be taken care of, not just what we're giving you in terms of supplements and in terms of stimulation, but all aspects, because we think these other aspects play a role in whether or not you're going to succeed. Now, does everyone succeed? No matter what we do, no, they don't. I hate to say it. I wish it weren't true, but it's true. We put in tremendous effort, but sometimes they simply cannot make that normal embryo. And these women typically have a very, a very low AMH, undetectable AMH, and uh, th this should actually be reduced. A reduced antral follicle count, one egg, two eggs, and, uh, and the quality when they come out is very low. These are typically women above 45 and above, but it can happen at any age. Well, what do you do if you fail, if you just consistently fail, even though everything's being done right? Well, you can do ovarian rejuvenation again, but I don't want you to do ovarian rejuvenation again and incur the cost of that. So it's much better to do one of these multi-cycle uh, multi packages to begin with. Many of the women we see, as I mentioned earlier, they did not become pregnant, at least in part because the fertility center they were working with just simply didn't do, just our opinion, a great job in terms of the stimulation. And they did things during the course of the cycle that are known to reduce the chance of success in the end. And so anytime we see a failure, we carefully look at exactly what was done in the previous cycle and we make whatever changes are necessary in order to increase the chance. And I know this is everyone's least favorite option and it's my least favorite option too. And that is to consider egg donation. And there are some women that just get to the, get to the end of their journey and they realize it's simply not gonna work. And we're working hard to eliminate this, but 
sometimes they get there and they understand that they need to use egg donation. Fortunately, here at uh, Gen 5, we, we have that we're aware of the largest group of egg donors in the world. We have over 50,000 women, believe it or not, in the screening process and uh, over 10,000 egg donors that are available uh, for you to assess. Now, this brings up an interesting point. There are two different uses for donor eggs. One of them is the traditional egg donor cycle. And there, the eggs are, are retrieved from the egg donor, and then all of the eggs go to someone who decides to work with that woman and receives all of the eggs. You can also, though now, with this new, uh, this new center that we've developed for women that do need egg donors, you can actually go through a fresh cycle, but only take four or five eggs, or you can choose frozen eggs. This is a tremendous advance in the field of egg donation. For years, women had to incur this huge cost which involved lots and money and time and everything else to take every egg the egg donor had. Now you don't have to do that anymore. And so uh, if, if you ever get to the place that you need to do that, we'll be happy to go through that with you. But the thing I really wanted to mention is what we call a combined cycle. And what we do there is we take one embryo from the intended mother and we combine it with one embryo from the egg donor. We have had a substantial number of pregnancies over the years doing this. And you might say, well, you know, the, the egg donor embryo is the one that implanted. But no, what we've noticed in several of these cases is that after twins are born, they're tested to be sure that it wasn't the egg donor embryo that divided. And what we found is that a number of these women who were felt to have an extremely low chance of success were able to become pregnant because they had a transfer, not only of their embryo, but that of an egg donor. How does this work? It's called the cooperativity effect. What happens is the egg donor embryo releases substances to help itself implant, but these substances diffuse and they go to the areas in some cases where the intended mother's embryo is as well, and they're able to assist them in implantation. So combined cycles are definitely something to consider if you're also considering doing egg donation. It's a way to get both done at the same time. And this, this just shows you the types of egg donors that we have and you'll learn all their characteristics and you can pick the right one for you if you get to the stage that, that that's the right thing to do. So uh, our primary research focus, our primary clinical focus here is what we've been discussing for the majority of this talk, PRP, implant, ovarian rejuvenation. We care not only about ovarian rejuvenation techniques, we care about how the cycles are done. As I've mentioned now two or three times, there are so many ways to mess an IVF cycle up. So many ways. You can start with the wrong dose and you're, it's over immediately. You don't make changes during the cycle. You go too long, you go too short. So many mistakes are made. 70 to 80% of the women we see here have failed cycles elsewhere. So I have seen almost everything done. And so we really care about doing the IVF cycle right. If we do ovarian rejuvenation and we improve the quality of the eggs, and then we do a poor quality cycle, we're not gonna see the benefit of that. And so by combining ovarian rejuvenation, as well as doing the IVF cycle exactly as it should be done, that's how you succeed. It's the combination of those two things. We also have a new way of doing PGS, PGTA, which is genetically screening the embryos that we use that has markedly improved the chance for patients to succeed. And if you would like, if that's important to you, we'll discuss that with you uh, when we talk to you in person. So these are some of the many papers that we have. You can go on the website under research. And I think we have all the papers or almost all the papers as PDFs under that particular link. 
This is our center here, the Gen 5 Center. And I love the center. I feel so lucky to be here. And you can look out beyond and you can see the green. And the, this, these are uh, protected areas. These are areas that should never have any building on them. And you can look in far distance and you can see the Pacific Ocean. So it's a very peaceful place. It's a place for fertility. And it's a place that, that so many women have succeeded. And that's why I do what I do. That's why all of us do what we do. We want you to succeed. We want you to be able to have the baby that you desire. In the end, it's all about these kids. And I love these kids. And some of them are looking this way and looking that way. Kids are amazing and nothing changes your life like having a child. And, and I hope that whatever you decide to do in the future, you succeed, that you achieve your goals. And I'm gonna pass things back to Rika now to take any questions that you might have. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Wood. Oh my gosh, we had a lot of private messages that came through. We had a few chat boxes as well, but um, you know, Again, just want to thank everybody for taking the time to be here with us. And thank you, Dr. Wood, for going through all of this. I know that you like to do um, more of the personal uh, consultations with everyone, which is why we do have a few really great prizes. So it's ultrasounds, um, sperm, semen analysis, and we have the free consultations as well and baseline blood work. So with that, we will be doing a drawing afterwards just to keep anonymity for everyone Everybody that's joined, but um, let's kick it off with some Q&A, Dr. Wood. What do you say? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Good. Perfect. Um, is IVF necessary for conception after ovarian rejuvenation? No. Actually, one of the three cases I showed you was a spontaneous pregnancy. We've had a number of them. Because remember what it does is it improves fertility generally. And so it depends on exactly where you are on the spectrum of infertility. But no, you don't need to do IVF. And in fact, if you're going to do IVF, you have to do it right. I have seen a number of women, as I've looked over these charts, who did three or four IVF cycles, did not become pregnant. And then the next month, they said, wow, I got to take a break. This is tough. And then they got pregnant on their own. So uh, IVF certainly enhances the chance of becoming pregnant in the vast majority of cases but it has to be done correctly. If you're not going to go to a place that's going to do it correctly, it's much better to do either inseminations or the traditional method in an attempt to become pregnant. Wonderful. Uh, the next question is, do we offer multiple OR packages? Oh, absolutely. I think that's a, a critically important thing. And I noticed that some women needed more than one. We were hoping at the beginning that one would do it. But it kind of makes sense that when you're dealing with something this difficult, particularly in women who have been trying for so very long, that sometimes one would not do it. So yes, just contact the staff and they'll go through your options with you. Wonderful. And um, I know that you spoke a little bit about endometriosis, but do you recommend this for somebody that does have endometriosis? <clears throat> You know, in, endometriosis is a long time interest of mine. And the interesting thing about endometriosis is that you have to understand why endometriosis is associated with infertility. In severe cases of endometriosis, it can be because of scarring and things like that. But in general, the problem with endometriosis is that the tube is unable to pick the egg up at the usual rate. And of course, if the egg doesn't get into the tube, it's not going to meet the sperm, it's not going to grow as it should, and it's not going to lead to implantation. So these techniques work extremely well for women with endometriosis. And to be honest with you, I don't worry about endometriosis. When I see a patient with endometriosis, I actually know her success rate is excellent. And the reason is, I understand what, what, what's causing it. And so when you do IVF and you take the egg, from the ovary and you mix it up with the sperm outside and then put the embryo back into the uterus, you've avoided the primary problem associated with endometriosis, which is the inability of the tube to pick that egg up. So absolutely, these are excellent techniques to use if you have endometriosis. Wonderful. 
Um, this next question, I know that we do offer this, but just to have Dr. Wood explain this a little bit, do we offer IUI here? Absolutely. Yeah. There's a funny thing about IUIs. Most fertility centers do not like IUIs. They wanna do IVF cycles. But I've always felt the thing you should be most proud of is doing the least you need to do to help someone become pregnant. And so we actually focus on IUIs. We don't do a huge number because we're very well known for, for IVF, but I enjoy them. And every year we have a number of pregnancies and we actually have a very good pregnancy rate with IUIs. Obviously, you have to look at all the details of your specific situation to make sure that it's the right thing for you. But absolutely, I think for many women, that is exactly what they should try first. Many of them will become pregnant when they do that and will not need to do IVF. But it's highly individual. It's something we'll discuss specifically with you. Wonderful. Uh, we are getting a lot of questions, uh, but just to make sure that we answer one last one before we are, we'll, we wrap things up here. We have a patient that is 35. She said that she has done five IVF cycles elsewhere. She didn't know about ovarian rejuvenation. Is there hope for this patient to come here and do ovarian rejuvenation and get it right? Well, you know, I need to know other details, mm -hmm. but as I told you, if you're 35 and there's nothing else substantial going on, then of course the chance of success is extremely high. Don't feel that just because you failed multiple cycles that you're not fertile or that you have no chance. We help women routinely like that. Last year, we helped someone that had failed 18 cycles, someone else that had failed 15 cycles. Many years ago, in fact, it was a story in the paper here in town, we have someone who had failed 21 cycles. They had done everything. They used an egg donor. They used a sperm donor. They used the surrogate. And then we saw them and we were able to help them using their own eggs, their own sperm and their own uterus. And they ended up with twins after failing 21 cycles. So never believe that every fertility center is alike. You have to do things right. You have to be assessed correctly. And then every single detail of that cycle has to be done correctly in order for you to have your true pregnancy right. So at 35, generally it's no problem. But as I said, there are a variety of things that might reduce your prognosis. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wood. Thank you for tuning in with us as the audience. And again, uh, you know, everything that happens here at Gen 5 is very unique and specialized protocol for every single one of our patients. And not only will you have access to Dr. Wood himself, but to the, his incredible staff that he's trained and built here to, um, you know, create a lot more of those incredible success stories. So thank you again to everybody that tuned in. We have all of your questions dialed in here. So if we didn't get a chance to answer them live, especially the pricing questions. It depends on which package that you decide to move forward with, but all of that will be outlined for you when you come in for your uh, consultation. So thank you again to everybody. And we look forward to working with you. We look forward to having you be our next success story. Thank you and have a thank wonderful Thank you, Rika. Thanks everyone.